Now let's be honest for a minute. Chances are really likely if you're over the age of 25, this was probably one of your first model kits. Hey everyone, this is John from EastCoastArmory.com and I'm here today with a model showcase video for this vintage Tamiya Panther Alpha. Now the model in this video was built for my own personal collection and is not for sale and or purchase. However, like I often mention in these smaller scale build videos, I often take on commission build projects from models ranging between 135th scale and 16th scale. For availability and pricing information, this information would be best by contacting me through the email address which is listed below, which is info at eastcoastarmory.com. Now the model that you see here is built mostly out of the box, however, did undergo a few modifications and additions made above the stock standard kit. We'll be going over all of these additions and features in this video, not to mention also a review of the basic kit itself. So stay tuned, there's a lot of info coming your way. Before we go any further with the video, let's go ahead and take a quick walk around this mall. And this vehicle here is the Panzerkampfwagen 5 Panther, more specifically the Panther Alf A. Now to the casual observer, you would think that the Panther A must be the first production version of the Panther. And, well, you would be wrong. For some reason, the Panther is the only tank where the A designation was actually the second iteration of the vehicle that was developed. The first Panther was known as the Panther Alf D. Now most tank fans and historians will tell you that the Panther's design was heavily influenced from the Russian T-34. During the beginning phases of the war, the Germans were primarily using the Panzer III and the Panzer IV as the main backbone of their armor force. Upon first encountering the T-34, the Germans were completely taken off guard at the vehicle's design as well as its performance. The Germans were so impressed that they went ahead and requested from the German High Command a new medium tank which would be able to better deal with this threat. Now, at the time, the Germans were also developing a heavy tank, which would of course eventually lead into the Tiger I, but they wanted a new design medium tank for its new tank generation. Several designs were brought up by the German heavy equipment companies, one of which was practically a complete ripoff of the T-34's design, and the other one was very similar in its design concept to the T-34, but was a little bit more German. This design was proposed by the company Mann, and this was the tank that would be approved and would eventually become the Panther. The Panther was really the first of the new generation of German tanks. The Tiger I, although it entered service around the same time as the Panther, really design-wise was still in the past. The Tiger I, Panzer III, and Panzer IV still utilized the general box shape, which was found on the German periods of the period. But the Panther was the first to utilize a all-sloped armor design with the interlocking puzzle assembly type method. This type of armor design would be seen on the vehicles that came and were developed after the Panther, such as the King Tiger and the proposed E100. Now, just like the Tiger I, the Panther's design utilized a torsion bar suspension with an interloven wheel design. Also, just like with the Tiger I of the period and with the other German tanks around this time, the road wheels were rubber tire rimmed. To propel this vehicle, the Panther A was equipped with the Maybach HL230 V12 liquid-cooled gasoline engine. This was the exact same engine which would later be added to the Tiger I because the original 210 was underpowered. Now, although the HL230 was still deemed to be underpowered on the Tiger I, the HL230 in the Panther, however, was a better power plant. Because of the thinner armor on the Panther, the vehicle had a lot better performance on both on and off-road conditions with this engine. With the HL230, the Panther can hit a maximum speed of about 34 miles an hour, which is actually pretty impressive for a vehicle of this weight class. For the vehicle's armament, the Panther A utilized a single 7.5 centimeter KWK42 L70 main gun. For the secondary armament, it utilized two MG-34T machine guns. 
Now one of the big differences between the Panther A and the Panther D was the design of the cupola. The cupola design on the Panther D was more of a drum type pattern which was similar in design to the one found on the Tiger One. While the Panther A, this was revised to the sliding hatch type cupola with a panoramic view which was more in line with the cupola designs which were to come for the Tiger I as well as the ones found on the King Tiger and later designed German tanks. The Panther A entered into full production in August of 1943 and production ran all the way up until August 1944. A total approximate of 2,200 units were produced. Eventually the Panther A's production line was halted once the Panther G design entered into full production swing. Where the Panther G made several modifications and improvement to the Panther A's design, simplifying it and making it better for mass production. Let's go ahead and take a step back to when the model was first started in order to get a good idea on what the base starter kit supplies you with. And here's the model at the start of the build. For the base starter kit, I'll be utilizing this vintage Tamiya Panther Alpha A plastic model kit. Now, even though I refer to the model as being a vintage model kit, that's not necessarily true because this kit here, from what I've been able to determine, is still in full production by Tamiya. I guess it's one of those type of things where if it's if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Now, where do we start? Okay, the Tamiya Old Tooling Panther Alpha A. This is one of those legendary kits where, like I said in the pre-video bumper, if you're over a certain age, chances are really good, this was probably one of the first model kits you ever built. And there's a reason for that. These models here are extremely prolific. They've been in production for a long period of time, they were offered for very affordable prices, and are super easy to put together, which again makes them a plus for beginner novice builders. In fact, at the end of this video, I'm going to go over some attributes that this model have, which really makes it a very interesting aspect. Specifically since it's more interesting as why you would want to buy one of these, as opposed to what the kit actually offers the builder. Now this kit actually has a very interesting background. These kits here were really the second generation of Tamiya plastic tank model kits. The first generation kits date back to the mid 1960s and some of those early kits would include their first Joseph Stalin 3, their AMX 30, and I believe also an M40 self-propelled gun. These model kits are extremely rare and if you have the opportunity to snag one you're going to be paying big bucks for them because not a whole lot of them were made and to still find them in the original boxes is definitely something that is quite rare. Move along to the end of the 1960s, Tamiya decided to release a, another range of model kits but to really start improving the detail fidelity on them. And that's really where you could say the 135th scale model kit was born. Some of the newer release kits was this Panther, their original early production Tiger I, I believe their Hunting Tiger, which is what they refer to it, but of course that's the Yag Tiger, the M41 Walker Bulldog, as well as I believe also their Panzer II. And oddly enough, funny to say, but all those kits I just mentioned are basically still in production to this day as well, which shows the viability that these old kits still have. Anyway, back to the story. At this point, Tamiya were offering their model kits in a motorized form. This wasn't uncommon at the time, as this was also being done by a few other Japanese model kit companies of the period. Such companies as Bandai or Nichimo come to mind. However, while those models generally were in these weird off scales like 130 or 132, Tamiya went ahead and went with a scale that would eventually be known as 135. With the Tamiya kits, the reason why they went with 135, as the legend goes, is because they wanted to be able to have a detailed model but have it be capable of fitting two C batteries mounted on the inside of the model along with its gearbox. After the engineers did some math, they came to the scale which would be 135. Now, although Tamiya did have an earlier rendition of a Panther, this model's tooling here was light years more advanced and better detailed than their earlier rendition. 
Around this time, I believe Tamiya had their engineers go to the Aberdeen Proving Ground as well as also to the Bombington Tank Collection to take photographs of some reference material. This is definitely noticed because many of the vehicles that are in the APG Collection and also the Bobbington Tank Collection were released by Tamiya in the various skizes. If anyone has ever been to the APG and for instance saw their M10 tank destroyer, you're going to see a resemblance between the real one preserved at the APG as well as the Tamiya kit which was released back around the same period. But that's really a story for another day. These kits here are all made from injection molded plastic and do have a single piece vinyl type track. Unlike again the earlier renditions from Tamiya, the tracks on these models here were considerably better with their molding and detailing, again along with the other molding and details found on the rest of the kit. These kits here, specifically this Panther kit here, was released back in 1969, so these are one of their oldest kits that are still in production. Now when these kits were released they were originally sold in two formats. We have standard single motor motorization as well as a more advanced unit which had a two motor gearbox and a wire remote control. The way to tell these two apart is that the standard motorized version had this exact type of box art where we have the tank in the foreground with the standard as we all know Tamiya style white background. The two-way wire remote control versions were a lot more elaborate with their graphic design where they actually had a very beautiful box art that was very nicely rendered and when you see one you instantly know it's one of the wire remote versions. Those kits from that period, the box arts are probably way better than the kit itself but we'll go into more information about that later. Over the years when Tamiya wanted to move away from the motorization aspect they eliminated the motorization feature and just sold the kits sans the gearbox in its static format. Now although these kits were designed to be motorized in the original plastic tooling they did have features so that you can build the model in a static format so there was no retooling required by Tamiya. They just admitted the gearbox and the electronic components and sold the model kit as is with the way you see it here. This is basically the way these kits have been in production literally ever since. Now it's important to mention that during the 1980s and into the 1990s, Tamiya decided to revamp their entire catalog because these older generation kits were really starting to show their age. And specifically at this time you had some new competition entering into the 135th scale field, namely from Dragon as well as also Italeri. And these older generation kits were not going to hold up compared to those newly tooled renditions. Because of that, Tamiya went ahead and revamped many vehicles in their in their lineup. This would include the Panther, the Jagd Panther, as well as several versions of their of their Tiger 1s. The vehicles I just mentioned utilize all new tooling and at the time were considered to be state of the art. Now, even though they did release those kits, first their Panther was actually a Panther G and this one here being the Panther A. However, even though they had their new Panther G out at the time. Their Panther G was con was a lot more pricier compared to their older generation offerings. The newer generation kits retail around for 35 to 40 bucks, while they kept their old first generation counterparts, but these were retailing anywhere from 16 to 20. Obviously, with this lower price tag, these made the kits much more obtainable and affordable for younger builders as well as also new builders entering into the 135th scale tank market. Like I said before, these kits are considered classics and like I said, basically have been unchanged since their standardized static release from the 1980s. Now the model that we see here that's sitting in my stash was actually acquired about 10 years ago off of eBay. Now when I purchased the model, I wasn't exactly going out of my way to find or track down this kit. This kit here was actually part of a model lot listing that was sold in an auction format. In that lot was a specific kit that I was looking for and that was really the one I wanted and this kit and another kit just came along for the ride. The model's been sitting in the stash ever since which definitely explains the sheer level of dust which you can see on the surface of the box. Ugh. Anyway, with all that crap now removed, let's go ahead and take a closer look at the model itself. 
Starting with the model's box art, here we have the Panther Alpha A in the foreground with the blank white background, which is seen on the majority of the Tamiya plastic model kits. Now, the quality of the illustration for the Panther is very nicely done. In fact, the illustration is done a hell of a lot better compared to the type of tooling and detailing you'll find on the actual kit components, which you'll see once I crack the box open. Note the detailing found on the final drive rigidity sections, as well as on the tank suspension. The remainder of the surface detailing is also nicely rendered out by the illustrator. From the tank now takes us to the typography. Here we have the word Panther written in a curved Bauhaus pattern font. And the remainder of the typography is basically standard for these Tamiya kits. Now here's a tip for anyone who is a collector of these old vintage Tamiya tanks is what to look out for when you encounter one of these units in the wild. There are a few ways to distinguish between a recent production kit and a first production kit. Of course, the first way to find out is if the model is motorized. That's generally a clue to the vehicle's age, because the motorizations were dropped in the early 1980s. However, another very quick way to tell if the kit is vintage or not is by the white section here of the box. Obviously, if this was an older model kit, the white would begin to yellow. And if the unit is bleach white like we see here, that's definitely not going to be the case. Another way to distinguish between the older and newer generations is, believe it or not, by the cardboard itself. If anyone's ever handled some of the older Tamiya kits, they'll definitely be able to agree with me on this. The cardboard, which is used on their current and recent production kits, is a lot more thinner and flimsier compared to the type of stock found on their early release kits. The early release kits, the cardboard was very stiff and rigid, and you wouldn't be able to have these little flappy sections that we have here on the ends. It would actually bend inward, and you would have a little Tamiya logo stripe run along the inside of the box. These are some of the key points to note when you're handling one of these older kits, and if you see one, you instantly know what you have. Another type of Tamiya early production Panther A to notice were the ones that were released in the 1980s, specifically in the United States. During the 1980s time frame, the Tamiya kits were actually being distributed by MRC Incorporate. MRC, which was located out in New Jersey, would handle the distribution of the Tamiya kits in the USA. This, of course, is prior to the advent of Tamiya USA coming to California and handling the distribution of the Tamiya kits in the continental US. These kits are distinguishable by having a slightly longer box and on this little corner over here there would be a little MRC logo found just hovering off into the white area. Now this was only seen on the kits with the white background. I don't believe MRC imported or distributed any of the two-way wire remote versions of these kits with the fancy box art as I don't believe they were in production when MRC made the deal with Tamiya. Continuing with the rest of the box, here we have, again, your standard side pattern of information. Thumbnail of the tank with some verbiage, probably more than likely a description of the vehicle's history. It's all in Japanese. And again, this is going to be what you'll find on a newer generation box because we have here some important Japanese recycling information as well as the corporate info, which of course has a website on it. Obviously, if it was an older kit, you're not going to have a URL. 1975 Tamiya is the copyright, and that was when this pattern of the static version of the Panther was being released, as opposed to the motorized ones that I mentioned before. On the sides here, we have the MM65 catalog number. Again, this is also something that is seen typically on more recent releases by Tamiya, as opposed to their first older kits from, again, the late 1960s. And of course, Tamiya USA is the distributor of these kits, as opposed to MRC. Now, one thing that was always cool about these older style Tamiyas are on the side section here, which is a bit of a cock tease, we have these awesome box arts, which 
showcased the two-way wire remote versions of their kits. Now, one thing that always frustrated me as a kid was, as a kid, you wanted to build these ones, but unfortunately they were long out of production, but they would still dangle these cool box arts in front of your face for, I guess, masochistic reasons. Okay. So here goes the Yag Panther, their King Tiger with the Henschel turret, their Yag Tiger, early production Tiger One, and their Panther, or I should say their Panzer Kampfwagen III. Again, these box arts here are awesome. If you ever get a chance to acquire one or see one in person, they, they really are just fantastically rendered. And in my opinion, some of the best model kit box arts ever made. And by this point, some people are probably saying enough with it. Crack open the box, show us the damn kit, which I will certainly do. Here we have the kit contents, which are definitely going to be anticlimactic, specifically for anyone who's used to more contemporary plastic model kits. First and foremost, like I said before, the kit is all comprised of injection molded plastic. And on these older patterns to me kits, the plastic was this Dunkel Gelb color. Keep in mind, a lot of times these kits were meant to be assembled out of the box where you technically don't have to paint it, you just put the markings on it and call it a day. Generally, these would be the motorized ones and you could play with them. The German tanks would be yellow or gray, depending on the kit, and of course the American tanks and Russian tanks would be molded in olive drab. Starting with the awesome moldings and the tooling found on these kits, takes us to the upper hull. Yep, after seeing this, you're definitely going to start appreciating more recent kit releases. As primitive as these kits are, however, they did do a decent, relatively decent job with the air intakes. Note this is a Panther A, so you do have the helical type fan guards. And this here is specifically taken off of the example of a Panther A, which was found in the APG tank collection. Which, oddly enough, I actually seen in person several years ago when I visited the museum. Anyway, you'll notice that there's going to be a lot of surface detailing missing, like little fasteners that ha mount the hatch plate to the upper hull. And also, the surface has this little rough pebbly texture to it. It's just something found on these older generation Tamiya coats. From the upper hull takes us to the lower hull. Now... The frowny face that we have here is because the kit's tooling is really old. No, nah, not really. The, the purpose of these sections here were for the motorization unit. Now, this is seen on several other Tamiya kits of this period, and many of the kits are, again, still in production, like their M60 or their M48 series. These little rails that we have here on the inside were for their gearbox, and you would mount the gearbox and the faster being this small little hole here, and you would adjust the track tension by sliding either forward or backward the entire gearbox. This little frowny, this frowny face little slot would be for your switch, middle would be off, left would be forward or reverse, and vice versa. The two oval holes were for your wire, for the two-way wire remote, and they would just trail out of the bottom here or through this hole that we have here to the, right, or to the remote. Now, some people are probably wondering, wow, that's a weird shape for the Panther Saw. Well, that's because this is actually the back. The front is right over here. It should look different and a little strange to people who know the Panther. Obviously, the Panther is a front wheel or a front sprocket drive vehicle, but to me, I mounted the gearbox in the tail. What's the purpose of this? Very simple. The Tamiya Panther and Yag Panther family were actually rear wheel driven. The front sprockets were dummies and were just there for detailing while the main drive was done through the rear section. Why this is the case? Well, this is actually something that's a problem with making Panthers radio controlled even up until today. With the shape of the Panthers hull, you have a very severe slope found here on the front. If I put the two hulls together, you'll see exactly what I'm referring to. There we go. With this very severe slope. Putting in a gearbox in this section here is definitely going to be very problematic. Which is why on the Tamiya 116 scale RC Panther they have a final drive setup to make it more like the real one and to avoid this exact same problem. 
Because of the lack of space, rather than adjusting the angle of the front here, which would hurt the looks of the model, they just went ahead and just dropped the gearbox directly into the rear. Now, oddly enough, Han Long made a mistake when they were making or copying the Tamiya 116 scale Panther, making their counterpart. Which is why if you look at the Hen Long version, what they did was they altered the geometry of this plate here, making it a little bit flatter compared to the angle that we have found on the front, which is why the Hen Long model is not as good as the new production Tegan 116 scale tanks, which are found. But that's either that's really a topic for another video. But anyway you can see that they move the gearbox again to the rear. As for the rest of the lower hull suspension, molded in torsion bars. We have here the little bump stops and the main bump stop found on the front. You'll notice these two large tubes molded in. That's for the front and last wheel. These would actually have a, on the motorized one, a steel rod going underneath the two, which would hold up the, and take the main weight and abuse of the tank being motorized. The wheels in the middle were basically just dummies and, again, would just be along for the ride and would just roll when the model was running. But the main stress would be on the first and last wheel, which is why they had the axle fitted to these. Oddly enough, as simplistic as this tooling is, to me it did do the appropriate direction of the torsion bars, which on one side has the torsion bars going to the rear section, while on the reverse side they're going towards the front. Interesting that they did that. Here we have the corporate info. Note the year 1969. Now I believe on the motorized versions or on the real vintage kits, it said this little oval here you would have made in Japan. Why they got rid of this was because I believe in recent years Tamiya moved their production facility for these older kits from Japan to the Philippines or Malaysia, which is why they then went ahead and milled away the verbiage found on these sections here. And this is also seen on the other runners found on various of these older style Tamiya kits. Moving from the hull, now takes it to the model's track. Now this tank does feature the single piece, all rubber vinyl type track. And these tracks are definitely going to start showing their age. Note the real spitting image the track face has to the actual Panther tracks. And on the inside, they're too cool to have their interior track pattern found. And of course, the track horns, sadly, are solid instead of being hollow. Working and on one of these older kits and seeing this type of tooling really makes you appreciate the type of quality that is just basically standard on more contemporary kits compared to these really old school counterparts. Funny though, I will still defend these tracks over Lincoln Length any day, so, you know, take that for what you will. The remainder of the kit's parts are found in this bag here. Go ahead and popped open the staples so I could dump out the kit contents. This runner is quite obviously the turret. Note the surface detailing or in this case, the lack thereof. However, oddly enough, they did the uh, weld cut lines, which is uh, a nice feature. And rendered not too bad, <laughs> considering that the surfaces do have this rough texture to them. I suppose one benefit of this rough surface is that it makes paint adhesion really, really good. Here we have the mantlet. Surprisingly, the machine gun and visor are not drilled out, go figure and neither are the exhaust manifolds. Here we have the main 75 millimeter gun. Of course, it's a two piece assembly, which is not uncommon to find even on newer kits of today. There's the hatch. Huh, they actually did little fastener sections. That's cool. The loader's hatch are functional, by the way, on these older Tamiya kits, as are the commander's cupola. And the bow hatches also work from memory serves. Digging deeper brings us to the rear hull. As well as all the other rear hull fittings. Note the tool rack mounts are separate moldings and need to be glued on. That's actually a decent feature. Tools are 
as one would imagine, quite basic. And so are the spare tracks. I will say though that they did do pretty good continuity because the spare track links look remarkably like the rubber tracks. So that's, you know, that's a plus. <laughs> The tail cables are supplied and they are made from plastic, just standard plastic. This was one area that had a little bit of difficulty because I believe to actually properly fit these to the kit, you, you need to actually hit them with either a heat gun or with a candle. Just like with that Hetzer kit that I did from Bandai, uh, they actually endorsed kits to play with matches back in the 70s. You know, cool times. The last standard plastic runner is, of course, the running gear. Now, these two lengths of plastic rods are substitutes for the metal rods, which I mentioned before for the lower hull. Again, to me, I actually had the foresight to mold these into the piece integrally. I guess they figure that one day they'll drop the gearbox, and if they do, they could save some pennies by omitting the metal rods because the ones are integrally molded to the runner. Here go the wheels. If I get the camera to focus, you'll see that the wheels do have their fastener detailings found on them as well as their rubber tire detailing. And the fasteners are true to form and are actually tiny little hex bolts. That's pretty cool. Same is also true for the sprocket. We have the little rigidity plates or the anti-lift plates found on their appropriate locations. And the fasteners are countersunk. Now this tiny little sprocket that we have here is actually your rear idler wheel. Like I said before, the tank was originally motorized with rear drive capabilities, and these little sprocket teeth over here would drive the model in its motorized skies. Now when you're building the tank static, of course, you're going to have to amputate these sections in order to get the model to be more correct. Finally, on the bottom of the box brings us to this section of polycaps. And these are typical on Tamiya kits even up till today, although not so much with the detailed faces that we have on them. This is something that Tamiya did a lot in the 1970s. It's also seen a lot on their 125th scale kits as well. If anyone built one of their Panthers or Yak Panthers, you don't know exactly what I'm referring to. Piece does have a little bit of flash on them. They're a little clunky, but you know, hey, if for back in 1969, these did the job. Here we have a decal sheet. Now these have been updated in recent years. Not so much with the type of markings found on them. Those were always the same as is the shape of the decal sheet itself. But what has changed is the quality of the decals. These decals are your standard current production blue paper type water slides. In the past on older kits the paper was white in coloring and I believe the decals were basically the same quality. To me, is, to me always had some pretty good decals but I believe the these ones here are made with more modern printing techniques and technology. But you have basic numbers, some crosses, kill rings, and a plethora of markings to put on your vehicle. Going down deeper brings us to the instruction manual, and this has not changed at all since these kits were first released. They have here some nice little verbiage about the Panther. They even showed the one in France, which was used by the Free French forces. Only this one is a Panther G. Cracking it open. Oh yeah, you know this is an old school Tamiya kit where you have the little tank commander guy telling you to read before assembly. And it's a little caricature of a German tanker. Those always change throughout the other Tamiya kits. And as you can see, here goes a way to unmotorize the kit. Add the suspension, assembly of the turret. And funny enough, these decal, or I should say, these uh, instructions, as simple as they are, they are a hell of a lot better than some dragon offerings. Consider that. <laughs> yeah, here goes something that's pretty cool. Note the uh, gearbox found right here in the back when they're showing you how to assemble the upper and lower hull. That's some vintage stuff right there. Also, to assemble the tracks, you're actually supposed to hit a a flat screwdriver with a candle to melt little sections of rubber pads in place to anchor the tracks together. Starting with the model suspension, all of the running gear components that you see have been fitted to the vehicle with the stock components with the out-of-the-box configuration. 
One thing that's interesting to point out has to do with the idler. Now, like I mentioned before during the unboxing portion, when this kit was originally designed, it was designed to be motorized. And as a motorized kit, the idler acted as the drive sprocket where you had several nubs molded in to grab onto the track in order to spin it. Now, if you are building this model as a static kit, obviously the drive sprocket teeth are no longer required and are actually requested by the instructions for you to amputate them. Now, on the instructions, they request that you do this with some kind of a utility knife. However, on the build here, I went ahead and did it with a more, shall we say, East Coast Armory approach, where I took the idler wheel and inserted it into my machine lathe. While on the lathe, I was able to turn away the unneeded material until the nubs were completely removed, leading for a nice smooth surface. With that out of the way, the idlers were then mounted to the vehicle suspension with no other mods being required. While on the topic of the wheels, you can see that, of course, I painted the center Zerk fittings with a drop of red paint. This is typical for one of my builds, and it's also found on the real German tanks. And like I always say, this is one little step that most people forget to do, but if done, kicks up the model's accuracy and makes it look a little bit better compared to leaving it oversprayed. Now from the wheels takes us to the track. Now the track is the stock setup and like I stated before are very very simplistic with their overall detailing. However having said that you can see that they do have the basic overall look shape and feel of the Panthers track. Now of course these are going to be much more inferior compared to the other more contemporary kits of the day but for really what this kit is the tracks in my opinion work just fine. Now one modification that I did make to the tracks that was really something I didn't want to do but I my hand was forced and I had to do it had to do with the simulation of the track sag. Now just like with the other German tanks of the period like the Tiger 1 and the King Tiger the Panther with its interloven wheel suspension without any sort of return roller design features a track slack like we have here. Now with the way the kit is stock, you're not going to have the track do this out of the box. When, when you put the rubber track on, it's going to have a more looser type appearance to it, and this definitely does hurt the look of this model. To correct this, I simply did the tried and true technique where you glue the track to the top portion of the wheels. By doing this, this actually greatly improves the look of the build and in my opinion really makes it shine compared to just leaving it stock with the track all loose. Now normally I am really not a fan of doing this to these type of tracks unless it is absolutely necessary and on a vehicle like a Panther or a Tiger that's absolutely the case. Now. Believe it or not, one question that I frequently get from my viewers as well as many emails that I get is, well, can you make this model pushable? As in, they want to play with it. And the answer is, well, yes, if you build it out of the box. Since this model was originally designed to be motorized, the wheels do spin freely and the tracks do run and engage the sprocket and the idler. And this model can be pushed to a certain extent until probably the plastic axle snaps in one way shape or form or another but yes to a certain extent you can play with it unless dot 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 you do what I did over here with the track solidifying it to the wheels now if you are building the model just to keep as a plaything and you know build it for fun then yeah go ahead build it with the stock track tension and call it a day however if you're building the model and you want to make it a little bit more accurate like I did then go ahead and secure the track in place like the way you see it on this build. Now from the track takes us to the lower hull, more specifically the sponson work. Now like what was showcased in the unboxing portion, this kit here does suffer from the to me Achilles heel of not having any hull sponsons. To me, I, I don't know, for one reason or another have always had that on their smaller kits and this guy here is no exception. Now on the model, this was one area where I wanted to improve because adding the sponsons, it's just, it makes the model a lot better in 
many respects. It's more solid, it's more sturdy, and you don't have that stupid gaping hole on the bottom. Now, on this kit here, unfortunately I can't really show the Sponson work in its completed state. However, I was able to take a lot of photographs of the build during its construction, and those should be popping up on screen now. Now, to do the Sponson work, basically each side received three plastic strips, which were mounted to the bottom here and they connected the upper hull to the lower. Now one thing that makes the Panther A a little bit trickier compared to some of the other Panthers has to do with the way the Germans designed the hull. Now on the Panther G there is just a constant angle from this rear plate all the way up to the front and this was done basically to simplify production that's why the Germans went with that approach. The Panther A it's a little bit more shall we say elaborate with the way you have to do it. So you have one plate here for the main stretch, a small little sliver plate here for the section, and then a final plate that goes all the way out to the rear. These plates here were fabricated out of sheets of styrene and were mounted after the upper and lower hulls were permanently glued together. In addition to adding the sponsons, I also deleted the motorization slot that's located on the back here for the insertion of the gearbox. Now, although I did all that, someone's going to point out, well, John, you still left the little frowny face on the bottom, and the reason for that is, well, I chose to. It, honestly, it didn't bother me. Keep in mind, the bottom of the hull is very, shall we say, simplistic in its detailing, in that there's none basically there. So going through the work to plugging up these holes was really unnecessary. However, plugging up the sponson holes is a lot more important, in my opinion, because this here is more visible from the outside of the model as opposed to the lower hull motorization holes which really can't be seen. Also keep in mind you have these two gigantic tubes running here on the bottom which hurt the look of the model accuracy wise. Again if you're looking for something more accurate avoid this kit. But you know for this build here I'm more than happy enough with living with the blemishes that I just mentioned. Back to the sponsons. Now in addition to the sponsons I also have to do the body work where the two plates meet the hull and once all this was done the bot the hull was much more sturdier afterwards. On the back here I also had a little strip of sheet styrene to act as that little connector plate which on the real Panther is what connects the bottom of the Sponson to the bottom portion here of the storage box. This is present on all Panther vehicles. Now other hull modifications I made besides the ones made to the rear had to do with the front welding. Now, as we all know, the Panther is very distinctive with having this puzzle type appearance with its hull lines. And on the front here, these two sections were actually absent. These here were marked with a pencil and then the, de the missing detailing was added via a Dremel. Once the detail was added to the bottom, I also went ahead and added to the front sections over here, which on the original kit were originally molded in, but were a little soft in their overall appearance. And if I would have just left the molded in ones, the continuity would not have matched the ones on the bottom. So because of that, for continuity reasons, all of the front welds were improved. From the welds takes us to the bow machine gun, and this unit here is left totally stock. Now, one of the dings that this kit does have is that the kit gives you what appears to be a standard MG34, while of course the real Panther for its hull gun would have been an MG34T. Having said that though, I kept the stock original unit because, well, the detailing is so soft on it that it could pass for either one. Now the ball is fully pivotal, like you see here, and this is also one of the reasons why I kept the stock unit. If I would have amputated and replaced it, I would have lost the functionality, and frankly, I wanted to keep that. I will also add that normally on my builds I tend to drill out the muzzle section of the bow machine guns, but on this model here it was left stock because the tooling was so thinly molded. If I would have tried to drill this out, it just would have let the problem. So on this one here, I erred on the side of caution and just left it purely stock. Moving along takes us to the front Bosch light. Again, very basic, but Nothing really to mention there. And the front visor. Now, one thing that's cool about the original Panther A and the Panther D was that just like the T-34, I don't know where they got the idea from, the front driver section actually has a direct vision periscope, which can open up. Now, it's a little stiff here with the paint. There we go. And it pops open on the kit here. It's cool that they made that piece functional. 
To close it, you just simply press down and it snaps directly back in place. Moving along takes it to the Pioneer tools. Again, very basic, but good enough in my opinion for what this kit is. And this now takes it to the gun cleaning stage storage tube. The tube itself is decently rendered, specifically for the age of the tooling, and is your typical type assembly where the tube itself is in two halves and then you have the two end caps that go on. Of course, with this type of assembly, you will have a seam to contend with. And once everything is polished away, the unit simply gets mounted. On the opposite side, you can see how the tool layout is, and here we have the jack block. Needless to say, very simplistic, but again, it gives you the idea of what the pieces are. And this now takes us to the spare track rack. Now, this was one area of the build that I deviated from the stock kit. Now, the kit does supply you with a rack that is separate molded from the upper hull, which is a nice touch, and the tra spare track links are designed so that you have to pre-assemble them in order to mount them to the spare track rack. Again, a decent touch specifically for the time. However, rather than utilizing those links, I went ahead and replaced both the rack and the spare tracks with a spare set that I had from a previous Dragon build that I did a little while ago. The Dragon links are much more better detailed compared to the stock Tamiya links, which basically were nothing more than plastic versions of the main tracks that we have here, which they're good enough, or I should say they're okay for the main track bands, but for the spare tracks, since they are a, a bigger focal point, I decided to give them a bit of an upgrade, which is why I went with the Dragon ones. With the Dragon track links added, it definitely improves the look of the model compared to just leaving it with the stock supply counterparts. Now, because I had to replace the tracks, the track rack also needed to be replaced as well because the two are not compatible. Luckily, with the way the runner layout is on one of the Panthers that I did, I had both of the components in access in my spare bin, and they came out to be handy for this build here. Moving further back takes us to the exhaust manifold system, and this being a Panther A, this would be the type of exhaust layout that would have been found on this vehicle. Now, all the components, again, are the stock Tamiya ones. However, the one modification that I did make was to the exhaust tips themselves. On the stock model, these are just molded totally solid and flat, and to improve them, I just carefully drilled them out with a pin vise and some small Dremel bits. This, again, greatly improves the look of the model. From the rear manifold now takes to the rear engine deck. Now starting with the two handles that we have here on the air intakes, these were new fabricated pieces and I didn't use the kit supply ones. The kit does supply you with these pieces but they're a bit chunky in their overall appearance and I did have problems freeing them from the sprue. Rather than trying to salvage them, it was easier for me just to replace them with metal wire. The two sections where they get fitted were drilled out with a pin vise and the new wire pieces were fabricated. The wire ones are much more finer and crisper compared to the plastic molded ones supplied with the kit. From there it takes us to the rear antenna base. Now the antenna base is present on this model and is very simplistic in its overall detailing. Surprise, surprise. But I was during the construction I did have a mistake that I made. And when I was drilling this section out with a pin vise in order to fit on a metal wire, the Dremel bit snapped on the inside of the base, making the addition of an antenna almost impossible. Because the Dremel bit snapped so close to the top here, trying to glue an antenna wire onto a flush surface like this is a very problematic venture, and it's one that I, I recommend avoiding at all costs. The reason is, it just never holds up. The piece will always want to fall over, break and snap off. It's just, it never works out well for you. When it comes to antenna bases, you actually want to have it embedded into the plastic and it gives it more support. So rather than going with that approach, I went with a little trick that I learned many, many years ago, which is you can just have the model rendered with the antenna just not fitted, which is definitely something that you would see on the real vehicle. To do this, I still glued a piece of wire to the antenna base, but if you notice, it's, it's much shorter compared to a full antenna. And this is because something that's this long is much easier held in place as opposed to something that's longer, which has more weight to it. Now, when it comes time for painting, the rubber portion of the antenna base is painted with a black or a dark gray material, while the little stub is painted with a 
little swipe of gold or brass paint. Keep in mind, on the real German antenna base, this tube here is actually integrally molded into or around the rubber bottom base that we have. And on the normal German antenna, it would just be, the top portion would be painted black, and I would still add a little swipe of gold or brass paint to this section over here replicating this. So if you're ever on any build and run across that issue, just use that technique and you'll be good to go. From the antenna base, takes it to the grill work, and you'll notice I left them 100% stock. Now if anyone's wondering why I didn't add the photo watch to them, the answer is pretty simple. I just didn't want to have this tank with any sort of grenade grills. Not every vehicle would have had them, and it's nice to differentiate your collection by having one or maybe two vehicles with the grills just not present. However, if you do want to add the grills, this is something that can be done, and there are photo etch kits on the market that will add this missing detail. Also, I kind of like how Tamiya did the detailing of the two intakes. Notice this one here is a slightly different pattern compared to the one on the opposite side. This would be true, by the way, of a Panther on this generation, or I should say this type of design. Now, I will say that this vehicle, you can definitely tell that when Tamiya was, you know, had their team studying the, these tanks, they definitely stopped by the Aberdeen Proving Ground Tank Museum. And this Panther kit here definitely reflects that because there is a Panther, or there was, in that collection for a number of years that has the two mix and match grill covers and also the detailing that we have right here. For the center hole, you'll notice that I went ahead and added a small bit of mesh work for this section over here. This would be present on the real vehicle. And the mesh work is just some PE mesh that I had lying around the shop. Now, for the filler caps, this is one aspect of the Tamiya kit that's pretty interesting. As, as far as I know, it's the only Panther kit outside of maybe the new Ryfield model ones with the full interior that has these pieces left completely exposed. On the real Panther, one of these, I believe it's this filler here, is actually for the fuel. And this one here is, I believe, the it's either oil or it's cooling for the radiators, it's either one or the other, so don't hound me too much on that in the comments section. But regardless, on the Tamiya kit, these cover caps are missing. Now on the normal Panther, there would be these armored discs on either section here with a small lock on them, and that's how you would cover these guys up, protecting them from any sort of damage from air bursts or any other type of, of incident. On the Tamiya kit, they are missing because, well, the one they were studying at the APG were missing these exact sections. So what you see on the APG one was what you got on the Tamiya kit. Now, rather than trying to go ahead and fabricate the missing detailing, which I could have done, instead I went the opposite. I actually, well, endured, I, I, I owned it. I left the pieces off and just painted and weathered them with the, the two cover caps that have been missing. <laughs> so what you see here are the colors of the, the actual containers themselves, and I added a little bit of weathering work of spill fluid on each end. It does give the model a little bit more of a pop, and it's something that is a little bit different compared to all the other Panthers that I've seen, and also the ones in my own collection. Also, you notice that the filler cap here is painted with a little drop of aluminum paint, which would be that color on the real unit. With the turret off, this brings us to the bow hatches. Now, the reason why I took the turret off is because with the, with the turret removed, it allows me to open the hatches a lot more easier, specifically on camera. The hatches just open and pivot out of the way as they would on the real vehicle, and this is stock with the kit. No modifications were needed to make this, mod this function work. While on the functionality, another piece that was fully functional on this old school to me a kit was the travel lock. When I put the turret back on, you can see how the travel lock would function. The piece would swing open, the lock section would pivot out of the way, and then the barrel would just go directly in place. And there we go. Now to make the piece hinge, you have to be very, very careful because the little nub that sticks out is very, very small. And to make it function, what you do is with a soldering gun or a soldering iron, or what people would use in the past would be a screwdriver and a, and a flame stove, is you just melt that tiny little section right over there, just enough to mushroom it so that it's enough to keep the piece from falling out, but it can still 
hinge and is free to pivot as much as it can. However, it is something you want to be very careful with. And of course, once done, it is going to be on the frail side. So you want to be careful when it comes time to actually manipulating this piece once completed. From the travel lock, this now brings us to the turret. Now, the turret itself was, again, a pretty much straightforward assembly. Nothing really much to talk about. However, on the mantlet, I went ahead and made some modifications to it. First and foremost, you'll see the cast texturing that was applied. On the stock kit, it's smooth like most of the tooling, but on the real Panther, this is one of the few pieces that would have been casted, and the German castings were uh, on, a little bit on the rough side. Now, with the texturing added, it definitely improves the model compared to leaving it in its stock configuration. In addition to the texturing, I also drilled out the the holes for both the optic as well as the coax machine gun. This, again, improves the look. Now, from there, it takes it to the barrel. Now, the barrel is a two-part assembly, which is common on most builds, but on this model here, I went ahead and added a modification to it. On the inside of the barrel, there is a metal rod that is basically entombed in a bunch of glue that keeps it nice and solid. Now, the reason why I did that to this build is one thing that I can tell you from these older kits is as the model will age, these type of barrels will begin to warp on you. It's just the nature of the beast when it comes to this type of barrel design. And this is a thing to watch out for on many other plastic model kits, specifically German tanks with these very long gun barrels. With the way these things are molded, there's not a whole lot of material on them. And again, as they age, warpage will begin. On this model here, as a way to mitigate it, I went ahead and basically entombed in a steel rod, which will give it some rigidity and a backbone and will prevent the barrel warpage from occurring. Now, because of the way the barrel is constructed, being a two-piece assembly, you will have a center seam to take care of. But again, this is something that is basically common on just about all plastic tank model kits. From the barrel and mantle, it takes these little hooks. These are, again, part of the kit and were assembled out of the box with no mods needed. Now, the kit does give you an ample supply of these. I presume they probably figured you might break one or two during the construction. Luckily for me, that wasn't the case, and they went on without any other problems. Moving further to the back, on the way the kit is assembled, you will have to glue this plate to the rear portion of the turret, and there will be some seams on these inner two sections over here. And these are, again, dealt with with just a drop of some thick super glue that's smeared in and then just polished away with some sandpaper. Once it's done, it leaves for a nice seamless appearance that we have here. Now, just like with the other hatches, the rear hatch in the back here is fully functional. And here's the hatch in its open state. Now, it's nice that the hinge does have two pivoting points, just like the real unit, although the interior section is rather simplistic. But again, it's a nice feature that this older kit does have. And again, the way you see it here is how the model was designed by Tamiya. No modifications were made. Piece clips directly in its closed position, and it works very smoothly. Now, from there, it takes us to the commander's cupola. Now, on the cupola hatch, I also went ahead and made this fully functional. And this was also relatively easy to do with this kit. The model's hatch does have a nice long stem to it, which gives you a nice sturdy point to melt the end slightly with a soldering gun, which keeps it in place and then allows you to pivot it and even drop it where it needs to go. Now, one modification I made was to the little handle here. This, again, is a piece of metal wire that was mounted into two little holes that I added with a pin vise. I don't believe the kit gives you this little bit of detailing, but was a very easy addition to add, and once added, also improves the accuracy of the build. Now, from the hatch, takes it to the anti-aircraft MG34. Now, what a lot of people don't realize on these German tanks is that the vehicles only would have had two MG34s per vehicle. One would be in the coax, and the second would be in the bow. When the vehicle would not be in use, like it's parked, it's being refueled or getting maintenance, that's when the MG34 would be removed from its internal mount and mounted on the roof to protect it from anti-air or maybe possible infantry attacks. But the myth that the tanks would have rolled into battle with the MG34 on the roof is just not the case. It's People see that with Shermans, with the M2, but with Germans, they just didn't utilize it for that role. Now, having said that, 
the MG34 looks awesome on top of the tank, which is why most people, including myself, tend to mount it on the vehicle. But again, it's one of those things you need to keep in mind if you're trying to make the model as accurate as you can. Back to the kit, the MG34 is just your average infantry MG34, while on the real vehicle, it would have been an MG34T. Also, you'll notice that the mount is very, very, very simplistic. And on the real unit, it would have looked much different compared to the unit that we have here. However, for this model, I just utilized the stock setup and just basically painted it. Now, for the MG34, I painted the barrel and the receiver section, as I normally do on my gun builds. And for the buttstock and pistol grip, I painted it with a brownish red color, which simulates the Bakelite, which would have been used on those stock and grip pieces during the war. Now from the hatch takes it to the anti-aircraft MG34. Now what a lot of people don't realize on these German tanks is that the vehicles only would have had two MG34s per vehicle. One would be in the coax and the second would be in the bow. When the vehicle would not be in use, like it's parked, it's being refueled or getting maintenance, that's when the MG34 would be removed from its internal mount and mounted on the roof to protect it from anti-air or maybe possible infantry attacks. But the myth that the tanks would have rolled into battle with the MG34 on the roof is just not the case. It's People see that with Shermans, with the M2, but with Germans, they just didn't utilize it for that role. Now, having said that, the MG34 looks awesome on top of the tank, which is why most people, including myself, tend to mount it on the vehicle. But again, it's one of those things you need to keep in mind if you're trying to make the model as accurate as you can. Back to the kit, the MG34 is just your average infantry MG34, while on the real vehicle, it would have been an MG34T. Also, you'll notice that the mount is very, very, very simplistic. And on the real unit, it would have looked much different compared to the unit that we have here. However, for this model, I just utilized the stock setup and just basically painted it. Now for painting the piece, the mount itself is just painted with Dunkel Gelb, but the gun, does have my usual painting done to it. For the barrel and receiver sections, they're painted with a dark gray or a flat black. That's then dry brush to give you that wear pattern that we see here. For the buttstock and the pistol grip, I went with a, a red-brown coloring, which simulates the Bakelite material, which would have been utilized for these pieces. Now on the MG34, there are a lot of options available for coloration of these parts. You had wood, for the buttstock. The pistol grips were also made in aluminum for the Russian winter, not to mention both pieces were made in either black or brown Bakelite. Now there were some other options for buttstocks in terms of other fittings, but that's beyond the scope of this video. Now, if you're building one of these models, any German model for that matter, and you're wondering what color to make your stocks, that's really left up to your discretion. From there, this now takes to the paint and the markings. Now, the model's camouflage is your traditional tried and true German three-tone camouflage scheme. This type of pattern would be around the late spring or early summer, and I want to say probably 1943 or so, which for a Panther A is more than appropriate. Now, for the markings, all of the markings on this model here are the kit supply ones, which were the water slide decals that I showcased earlier. The quality of the markings was, you know, on average with the other Tamiya kits, which needless to say is pretty good. However, I do want to point out that the crosses do need that little slice line made to them in order for the cross to be butted up against the front armor plate that we have here, which is a trait found on many Panther tanks of the period. And from there, this brings us to skill level and recommendation. Now, unlike most of the other builds that I typically do on this channel, where they, by and large, are meant for in someone with an intermediate to an advanced range in skills, this kit here, on the other hand, that's not necessarily the case. A beginner can definitely tackle one of these kits, although the paintwork is going to be a little bit of a limiting factor because of possibly the lack of an airbrush or a compressor. But the actual build itself is definitely beginner friendly. And needless to say, if anyone has some more advanced skill level range, obviously they could throw one of these kits together in practically no time at all. Now that segues us into the type of person who I would recommend this kit for, and that is really where this kit, in my opinion, is the most interesting. 
As the kit itself, as we've seen, is very basic and on the rudimentary end, but that does have a place in the hobby, and I'll go over that in a second. First off the bat, if anyone is a fan of World War II German armor, or just World War II tanks in general, this kit here is going to, is going to be a welcome addition to your collection. Also, if you are a Surefire Panther fan, I could definitely see this kit having some merit with your collection. On a similar note, if anyone is just a fan of collecting kits of the Panther, and yes, these people do exist, you can definitely see where this kit would find a nice, cozy little spot on that collector's shelf. Another type of person who I would recommend this model to would be the type of individual who likes to build and collect vintage model kits. This model here, although it's still in production or has been for as long as it has, is definitely a vintage kit. It's pretty much a living, breathing dinosaur in the parlance of military model kits. So with the availability and the relatively low cost of acquiring one of these kits, it's definitely more appealing than trying to track down a more expensive, rarer kit, which tends to be more expensive due to the collectability and the premium of which that you're going to be paying for for one of those models. With this guy here, that's not the case. You could get into it for, again, a relatively low amount of money. Another type of individual who I'd recommend this kit to would be anyone who's a handyman special builder. This is the type of person who would buy a vintage kit like this one here, or a kit that has relatively low or basic detailing, and replace as many parts on as possible to improve the detailing and the accuracy of the build. This model being 135th scale, you can possibly roid it up with as much resin and photo etch parts on it, and potentially kick it up to the next level, but is this something that's really worth it? Eh, in my opinion, not really, but then again, this is really left up to the discretion of the builder, as there are some people out there who have a pile of parts and are looking for something to challenge themselves on. That type of a build, it actually on second thought does sound very interesting and possibly would be something for you, and this kit here is again a good starter for that type of a project. Now, outside of those individuals that I just mentioned, if you are the type of person who is a diehard Panther fan, the type of person who thinks that the Panther was the best tank of World War II, you have a ton of books on the subject, you can tell every single production variant from man with the different wheel layouts and different weld lines and what have you, that type of person who is a rivet counting perfectionist, this kid here, is most certainly not the kit for you by any stretch of the imagination. The This kit here, the tooling on it is far too primitive and the basic detailing is gonna be far too basic for your type of needs. For someone like that, steer clear of this model here and you might wanna look elsewhere from something like Dragon, TriStar, Rifle Models, Tacom I believe even has a Panther kit. S one of those super kits would really fit the build better than this guy over here. This model here is really, again, more left if you want to build it as is with its basic detailing and are okay with the outcome with the stock kit components. Now, outside of that rivet counting perfectionist, this kit here being such a beginner-friendly model, I can definitely recommend for anybody of any age range from a youth builder all the way up to a fully grown adult. This model here, again, because of the availability and of the relative ease of construction, would make a fantastic model for someone who's really just getting into modeling for the first time. This model here would make a great weekend project for a parent, you know, spending some quality time with their kid and then showing them some crafts and having them explore some other creative outlet. If you're a teenage builder, this model here is also recommended for you. You could be given this as a birthday or a Christmas present. And also, if you are a more older builder, this model here is a nice, friendly welcome into the field of armor modeling. This kit here is also another great way for somebody to re-enter into the armor modeling hobby. This would be like the type of individual who they grew up building plastic models throughout their teenage years and even into their 20s, but had to set that hobby aside to pursue other life goals. 
and are looking to get back into the hobby. This kit here is a fantastic choice to do it, again, for its cost and availability. The model here, you get to do and brush up skills on gluing, sprue removal, and even bodywork. But it's not too overly complicated like some of the other super kits like I mentioned before, like from Dragon, etc. With this model here, again, it's a nice way to re-enter into the hobby, to get your feet wet, and then once you get this build out of the way, you get to re-acclimate yourself with more advanced kits. Another person who I'd recommend this kit to would be someone who actively builds plastic model kits, but are of different vehicle types. If someone likes to build planes, cars, or ships for that matter, and want to stretch your legs into the armor hobby, this model here is, a, again, a nice segue to do so. And finally, one other individual who this kit here would be a valid starter model for would be anybody who has one of the other more premium kits like I mentioned before, but are really unsure on how to actually paint and finish it. Some of these people, they have these kits, they built them, they're ready to go to the next step, but they're not really sure on how to apply the paint or what type of camo to put on and even how to weather it past that point. Someone might see a tutorial here on YouTube or some other tutorial on the internet and want to give it a go, but are a little cautious and don't have the confidence built up in order to try some of those techniques on their expensive kit. If you're one of those people, one of these kits here is a fantastic dry run in to try some of these techniques out so you get the feeling under your belt so that when you tackle the more expensive kit, your confidence is going to be greater and you're going to have less of a risk of going in blind. And if you botch up the paint job on one of these models here, no big deal. You could either just repaint it or strip it or, you know, do what have you with it. Either way, one of these kits would give you a nice feel of a panther before you go ahead and try something out on, say, again, a dragon or something similar. In the end, I'm really happy on how this build turned out. Like I stated before, this was a model that I didn't actively go out and look for. It just came as a tag along with an eBay auction lot that I purchased a number of years ago. And now that I finally got to it and built it to the condition that you see here, it is definitely one that I don't regret getting. The model, again, with all of its inaccuracies, warts, and blemishes considered, still polishes up well into a decent representation of a Panther Alpha A, in my opinion. And this model here is definitely going to be a welcome addition to my model tank collection. And I'm pretty sure it's because of the type of builders that I just mentioned, which is why this kit here has been in production for as long as it has. The model at the end of the day is still a very resilient little kit and definitely has withstood the test of time. And with that, that wraps up this model showcase video for this 135th scale vintage Tamiya Panther Alpha. If you like this video, be sure to subscribe to this channel where it's a great way to keep up to date on new posted content, be it from small scale model showcase videos like this guy over here, to the larger project update videos that frequently get posted on this channel. Another way to keep in the loop on new posted content is by liking us on Facebook. There, I have more photographs, of this particular build, as well as the other smaller and larger scale builds that have been showcased on the ECA channel in the past. Furthermore, don't forget to swing by EastCoastArmory.com, where there are more 1.6 and 1.16 scale builds and detail components. Till next time.